Hello, I'm Braddock Supervisor John Cook. Thank you for watching my news program, Braddock Neighborhood News, which takes an in-depth look at the local topics most important to you and our community. All too often, those experiencing a mental health crisis will come into contact with law enforcement and be unnecessarily incarcerated for a low-level offense. The Diversion First program was established to provide an alternative of treatment instead of incarceration in appropriate cases. This alternative will reduce crime, save money, and help people become self-sufficient. To discuss the Diversion First program, I have invited Ed Rossler, Chief of the Fairfax County Police Department, and Major Ron Kidwell from the Sheriff's Office to come on BNN and tell us about this mission. Chief, Major, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks. Thank really appreciate the, uh, the effort that everyone's made to come together on this program. And Chief, maybe to start, um, talk to us a little bit about uh, the issue faced by the officer on the street prior to this program uh, in what to do when uh, it comes into contact with someone who's got uh, maybe an obvious mental health issue and the transport problems we were running into. And, and we'll start from there. Sure, it was a cumbersome process. Uh, if an officer got a call for service and someone was experiencing a mental health episode, um, the officer would then uh, do a transport to a mental health facility and quite frankly would spend uh, greater than eight, nine hours, which uh, goes beyond their shift, to get this person medically cleared and then wait uh, a tremendous amount of time to get a mental health professional to assess whether or not this uh, person needed additional services. And what that did for our community is a disservice because the officer was not available to handle additional calls for service on the street. And also officers uh, would be disgruntled because they would uh, expend an enormous amount of time uh, not doing police work, sitting around and waiting. And also the fiscal drain is we would have to then pay the officer overtime because they were beyond their shift and oftentimes uh, we would have to backfill uh, their position on, on the street to meet minimum staffing. And the other cumbersome item is once someone needed mental health services, the police officer would have to do a transport and that transport would go to other ends of the state. And what we're talking about there is getting an, a, another officer because we needed two officers to make the transport safely to another mental health facility. And uh, sometimes we would have to expend uh, fiscal resources to house the officers in a hotel after they uh, transported this person to the facility because uh, they would uh, also be up 17, 18 hours and a, a couple hundred miles away from Fairfax County. Right, people don't realize that, but we're talking usually Western State, I think, is uh, yeah. Austin, where we're, and that's what passed. Harrisonburg. Yes, and uh, you know Petersburg or sometimes the Virginia Beach area, wherever there was bed space, which is obviously a big problem still today is bed space. But Diversion First now is right here in Fairfax County, and uh, we have great staff there uh, with the police department, sheriff's office, community services board, mental health staff. So officers realistically are, are spending just uh, two, three hours at most uh, taking someone to the Merrifield Center and getting them immediate services. We have a transfer of custody uh, that happens so the officer can get right back into service on the street. And that's really the, one of the keys here from an administration standpoint, right, is that uh, officer can take someone to Merrifield and at that point, uh, before that officer had to stay with that person because they were in police custody, right. that officer was personally responsible, had to stay for the duration. Now there's a transfer to a team at Merrifield. The right. officer goes back on the street to do his job Major Kidwell, pick it up for us. The Sheriff's Office helps out with our partnership at the Merrifield Center. Correct. Um, we have uh, three full-time staff and one supervisor at Merrifield, uh, which is identical to the staff that the police department currently have. And like the chief said, once someone, once the officer comes in and transfers that custody, then either the officer or deputy actually currently right now takes the individual to Fairfax Hospital where they have to get medically cleared to make sure they have no physical ailments prior to finding bed space and sending that individual to whatever um, whatever hospital that has the available bed space. And like the chief said, that, that bed space could be anywhere. Staunton, um, there's, there's 
very little bed space for juveniles, so we find ourselves making long transports to Petersburg on a regular basis when we're dealing with juveniles who have uh, who uh, need uh, medical or mental help. Um, from and the sheriff's office is helping us with that transfer, right? So transport. So before it was often the patrol officer right. doing transport. Now the sheriff's department is helping us with that. Right. When when staffing uh, is is available, we assist the police department in in making those transports uh, outside the Northern Virginia area. So any bed space in the adjoining counties, Arlington, Alexandria, those. Uh, deputies and police officers that are assigned to Maryfield, they do those transports, Northern Virginia, mental health, which is literally literally probably two minutes away from the Maryfield Center. But when you're doing long transports to Staunton or something of that nature, the police department will contact the sheriff's office, ask if we have available staff to make that run. And if we do, then we will, we will uh, send two deputies out there, uh, one which has to be CIT trained and transfer that, that individual to that, that particular bed space, wherever that hospital may be. And CIT means Crisis Intervention Team Training. Correct. Uh, something that both our police department and sheriff's department uh, have had and are really expanding. And uh, Major, talk a little bit about uh, what that training is and why it's important. Well, the, the training exists for officers to have a more in-depth uh, in, uh, realization about what an individual who's uh, suffering from a mental episode may be experiencing, recognizing it, being able to communicate, slow everything down, be a less uh, opposing, uh, I guess, figure. Um, basically just learning how to deal with individuals and communicating with individuals who may be in a mental health crisis or, or episode and trying to get that, that outcome or convincing them or trying to persuade them to do the things that they need to do in order to get the help that they need. And that's real important. In the jail, of course, a large percentage, maybe up to a third of our jail population has a significant mental health issue. So uh, having trained deputies in the jail, something you're familiar with. And Chief, on the police side, we want our patrol officers and officers on the street to have that training because we come in contact with an awful lot of people having a problem there as well. Yes. and. For a very long time, we've had crisis intervention team training. Uh, what has changed with Diversion First, uh, with a lot of stakeholders, community members, uh, providing support uh, by volunteering with our Criminal Justice Academy, is my goal for our police department to be 100% CIT trained. And the way we're doing that is each recruit class uh, gets CIT awareness uh, training and we've also stepped up in partnership with the community services board uh, our volunteers in the community the sheriff's office to have more classes at our academy for incumbent uh, law enforcement officers not only in the police department but the sheriff's office and other uh, jurisdictions like the towns of Herndon and Vienna and also our public safety partners at the dispatch center and the fire department to have some level of crisis training so when that 911 call comes in we could start to triage whether or not this is a mental health episode and as the major said the goal on the street for the officers on the call for service is to recognize these signs right from the dispatch and upon arrival at the scene to take the extra effort to slow it down isolate and start negotiation with the skills of how to get this crisis episode to kind of dissipate so then we could uh, get that person to the Merrifield Center for mental health services. Uh, this training is now mandated on an annual basis uh, by myself as chief uh, that we do practical scenarios to, to train on this so we're consistent because we know uh, from many decades of review of our use of force, especially the deployment of deadly force, that most of those uh, cases involve a mental health episode. So CIT training is the backbone of uh, making things work the right way the first time from the call for service to the dispatch center to uh, making the right decisions by, as the major said, uh, those uh, flags that come up that this is a mental health episode. There's a different way to handle this rather than thinking you have to make an arrest and take him to the jail because once we go hands-on that's when things go uh, you know bad sometimes and we don't want that to happen either so the training is 
critical to success uh, for everyone. Yeah, you mentioned that term de-escalation, and just to, so that viewers can kind of get an idea, let's say you have, you know, two, two different situations maybe in a store. It's one right. thing if you have somebody who goes into a store with the intent of robbing the store, and maybe they have a weapon, maybe they don't, right. but they may be using some violence, and they're there with the intent of creating a criminal act, and they need to be apprehended and arrested and, and go through the process. But you might get a call from somebody who uh, maybe they're homeless or maybe they're, uh, but they're a significant mental health episode and they're maybe hanging around the store, store, store owners worried, this person's maybe yelling at people or being disruptive, but maybe not creating any serious crime, uh, but that store owner needs help, realizes that person needs to be out of that store, right. they're disrupting things, they may have violated the law, maybe they haven't, but that's really where you can start to help. It, exactly, and in, in the worst case scenario, uh, you get a 911 call uh, where a family member is, is highly upset because someone that they love is having this mental health episode and they might become violent towards that family member and uh, on its face, you, you might take that as a domestic violence call but if the dispatcher gets enough information out of the person that's calling that obviously has a lot of anxiety and fear uh, to determine what, what is this and get that information to the officers that are responding there so then they could start looking at the situation to realize, you know, this person's highly agitated, they're having this episode, so let's use the skills from the CIT <coughs> training to then calmly uh, de-escalate versus uh, the officer yelling back at the person and realizing, you know, this will take time and technique to uh, calm it down and then uh, get the person, hopefully in a, in a voluntary basis, uh, let's go to the Merrifield Center versus realizing, okay, there, there are minor crimes committed, uh, but what, what's the greater need here? Uh, mental health services. We could always work with charges later. Uh, clearly, if it's a violent felony, that's a different case. But in all these scenarios, uh, we try to mitigate to get the person mental health services first. And uh, Major Kidwell, you know that from your experience in the jail, that um, jail is an, uh, an appropriate place if somebody, let's say, has been in that you know, violent situation, they robbed a store or they are, they've you know, beat up a family member and, and they have the criminal intent and they need to be held pending a trial. Um, but you know that if it's the other, if it's someone who has had a mental health episode so they've been disruptive someplace and they get arrested and taken to the jail, things don't get better for them or the ones around them. Correct. And there are, obviously there are situations where individuals do come to the jail who are suffering from mental health uh, issues and maybe they didn't show those symptoms on the street and as they're in the jail, you know, they may begin to deteriorate and the sheriff's office recognizes, you know, these individuals, they have a meeting once a week with uh, the sheriff's office and the CSB because the CSB has clinicians staffed at the jail and we discuss these these individuals who, who, uh, who may be needing help on the outside, um, and there's many ways of getting that type of help. Uh, the sheriff's office will go to both the, the, uh, the individual's attorney um, or the commonwealth attorney, depending on what the charge is. We talked about trespassing or something of those nature, what we consider nuisance crimes, and maybe negotiating if we agree that the sheriff's office will, if, if the person's released on, say, their signature that they agree to appear and the magistrate's willing to do that, the, the magistrate also is willing to do that on the basis that the sheriff's office will take this individual, transport them to Maryfield, will they'll be evaluated and determined if there needs to be a TDO, a temporary detention order for this individual to get further assistance. Um, or the, uh, in situations where we also recognize that there are situations where someone cannot be diverted just based on the crime that was committed. And in those situations, they still may need some uh, mental health treatment um, we would go the route of what we consider a criminal TDO um, and when that happens, when someone's placed in the system, the, the options are limited prior to, meaning that when someone is diverted on the outside, uh, as far as bed space, they, you can utilize you know, private bed space. Once someone is incarcerated and charged with a crime, it limits our uh, abilities to find bed space because now that that individual who has been charged with a crime can only go to a state facility. 
which would be Northern Virginia, uh, mental health, or Western state. Or, so it, it limits uh, the options that, that the CSB may have to locate a bed given the circumstances once a person's incarcerated. And that, and that end game in the first case of sort of that you know, that real criminal who, you know, we want to see brought to trial, an appropriate sentence, but here when someone who is trespassing or they've been disorderly in a store or something uh, because of a mental illness, if they're arrested and they come to the jail and they can't post bond, their condition tends to get worse. Correct. Right? Often they can't post bond, so they may be in jail for two or three months on something that somebody else would post $100 and be out the next day. Right. And so by the time they get out, maybe three months later, because they've had a court date, they're in a worse condition than they were previously. They go out in the street and what happens? The same thing, they go to the store, something bad happens, and they come right back to the jail. Right. And we see that all so often. What we really want to do is have that person get treated so that they're not committing the next crime. That's how we reduce crime. Exactly. And uh, one of the key uh, factors is the officer's discretion on uh, these nuisance crimes. And the success of the Merrifield Center uh, to date, over three, 375 people have been diverted in 2016, which shows us that the officers have embraced this philosophy and, and clearly it's improving. It provides that alternative and the officers, quite frankly, see success in treatment uh, because some of the uh, individuals that we come into contact to prior to Diversion First are repeat customers. I mean, we've had statistics in some of the studies across the country, as many as 80% of people with a mental illness who get arrested, go to jail, come out, they're committing a crime again. Some of the best programs in the country can get that down to maybe as low as 20%. Exactly. And if you look at that differential, just based on that 370 some diversions in the period of, a, of the first year, uh, we may have prevented over 200 crimes if, if those folks have gotten treatment and then not prevented the next crime they would have committed already. Exactly, and, and from a use of force perspective, uh, all of the training that we've been delivering to the officers and other public safety personnel uh, it, it's successful because the officers now have the ability to slow the situation down and get these mental health services. So we're not coming back a second, third time. People are getting help and their mental episodes are not escalating. Uh, obviously through the mental health services, whether it's uh, prescriptions or other uh, counseling services, uh, we're getting someone back to a level that they're well so the police are not having to come back. Right, so people are getting better, we're having less crime, we're saving some money too. Uh, people don't realize it, but the um, Sheriff's Office runs the most expensive hotel in the county. Correct. I mean, it's $64,000 a year for someone to be incarcerated in the jail uh, because of the many things that you must do. Right. Uh, and for a fraction of that, we can provide mental health treatment. And, and like you had spoke to before, Supervisor Cook, was that uh, an individual who uh, stays in, who's charged with a trespassing charge who can't make bond and they, they may stay in the facility for maybe approximately 45 days before they go to court before the judge and by that time the judge usually uh, releases the individual because he's time served or she's time served based on the charge um, 45 days in jail it costs the last number was two hundred and thirteen dollars a day to house someone in jail compared to if we would have gotten that individual into treatment and gave them the treatment they need they needed at the time and Again, so we're talking about 45 days in jail and possibly maybe a, a week in treatment. And that's, you know, and, and, and then just the whole, uh, the space that's needed in the jail, the, the number of people who are in the jail because they're on that 45 day trek, if you will, that otherwise they wouldn't have, you have to have a lot of extra jail space that um, uh, once we can get diversion moving, uh, we won't have to maintain that jail space. Correct. Um, then what you also have so the staff associated with watching all those individuals, you know, the, the cost of, uh, of housing the individuals, you know, all that adds up at the end of the day, obviously. It's expensive and of course what we need, uh, who we need in the jail are the people who have committed violent crimes right. that are sentenced and or awaiting trial that we need to keep separate from society and, and that's uh, the job of you and your colleagues is to keep them in jail. Uh, and uh, but to be a mental health provider um, is a difficult 
burden to put on the sheriff's office. Right, and and, and the sheriff always said that um, that the, the jail is the, the individuals who are in jail do not get treatment; they get services. And these individuals need treatment, or they will not get better. Um, you know, they 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 need to be put on a regiment. They need uh, you know the the professionalism of uh, individuals that can send them on their way. Right now, we just we manage. We manage the, the individuals, the, hoping that they don't get, you know, any worse. We, we're managing the situation. We're not truly treating anyone. I think that's an important point. Um, you really, you really can't treat mental illness in jail because jail is a stressful Correct. place to be, and the whole circumstance of someone being there uh, makes it such that they're not going to be able to improve, even with the best of therapy, which is just extremely difficult to provide in the jail. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Chief, um, uh, we've uh, we're seeing success um, on the street. We're, we're hopefully going to free up our jail space for those who we most want in the jail. Um, let's talk a little bit about the cooperation between agencies, community services board, police, sheriff. Um, it's been a great thing I know for us to see on the Board of Supervisors, our various agencies really learning how to work together and uh, talk a little bit about how that benefits everybody. Sure. Uh, right now, uh, Lieutenant Ryan Morgan is uh, full-time as a police commander assigned uh, to the Merrifield Center. <coughs> and as the major indicated, we, we have uh, parallel uh, full-time uh, police and sheriff staff working with community services uh, personnel. And together, we are a team. Uh, we're working as a, a unit. Uh, it's not only at the ground level, but from the leadership level. And we're really blessed with a lot of great community advocates uh, on mental health that are providing guidance to myself, to the sheriff, and, and all of us um, through the growth of Diversion First. Obviously, uh, we just got this off the ground as a, as a team. Uh, the community, the political leadership, and the public safety agencies. Uh, but through stakeholder meetings uh, that continue, uh, we are developing a great strategic plan for the next three to five years. Uh, clearly, we need to uh, get this up and running at a 24-7 basis. And uh, as we train more officers and public safety personnel, uh, we have seen uh, since the program started uh, the number of diversions are, is increasing, the number of contacts and referrals is increasing. Uh, we're doing great work. Uh, so I know the Board of Supervisors, uh, along with the community, uh, are supporting the growth of Diversion First. And uh, we, we know from looking at uh, best practices across the nation, uh, this will take many years to uh, fully develop. And uh, we're on a great path. It really is a, it's a five-step process for us. So we call these five intercept points. We've discussed here to, today mostly the first step, which is uh, catching the person right on the street and saying, where should that person be? Right. But we know we've got a second spot right as we enter the court system right. uh, where our magistrates and our court services folks can, can uh, find someone who's coming in and saying, wait a minute, maybe this person ought to be diverted. We've got our um, court system, so maybe it's at sentencing uh, or you know, during the criminal process where a judge or Commonwealth's attorney, public defender can can uh, you know, catch a situation. Uh, the jail itself, sheriff's office, is, is increasing its ability to train officers and also look for opportunities to, to get people into more appropriate settings. And then ultimately, ideally, the fifth intercept is really the first, which is having a community-based mental health system like we're supposed to have, where uh, we're not waiting for someone to commit a crime before we can serve them, but that we've got community services in place. And so that's going to take uh, years, a uh, number of steps to go through. Um, but we know the importance of that, certainly in the sheriff's office. Um, uh, you have to deal sometimes every day with uh, people who are in the jail who have a mental health issue. And, and we've seen how uh, you know, bad circumstances can happen to folks. And talk a little bit about. Um, how we can improve how we're serving folks in jail by having uh, having programs that can get treatment for people with treatment. Well, um, I, I, first we're talking about the intercepts, and I'm happy to say in the intercept two, right now that we have a committee that I have. A, there's a lot of judges that are involved, and we're looking at the possibility of <coughs> uh, recognizing those individuals who would be eligible for supervised release and with conditions. 
of them going to either the sheriff's office actually transporting the individual in Maryfield to be evaluated or you know the the judge are releasing that individual to go to Maryfield to be evaluated so that's just another step in the the second intercept um, along with hopefully one day creating a mental health docket so like I said the long term looking at uh, the, down the future and keeping track and making sure those individuals um, get the treatment they need um, as, as far as in the in the jail um, like I said there's we, we have the CSB staff that that uh, assist us every single day. Their, their, their offices are in the jail. They interview individuals that are in crisis and, and they keep track of individuals that need help. Um, we, we provide, uh, the CSB provides some psychiatric um, hours. Uh, obviously the sheriff's office would like to see more hours, but um, that being that the, the psychiatrist comes uh, twice a week and, and provides services uh, in that in that manner, and also obviously whatever type of medication is needed for those individuals who are managing their their uh, mental health illness while while they're incarcerated. That's great. Well, I appreciate all the work that is being done in the sheriff's office and the thank police you. department. We're out of time. I want to thank T. Frostler and Major Kidwell for joining me today and for the work they do to help our community. I hope you have enjoyed this segment of Braddock Neighborhood News. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, comments, or other needs, please contact my office at 703-425-9300 or email braddock at fairfaxcounty.gov. Tune in next month for another edition, and please remember to volunteer your time. Our community needs you.